They warned about the cold weather and the danger it would bring. But their bosses ignored the warnings. One engineer went home that night and told his wife, it's going to blow up. The next morning, the world watched in horror as seven astronauts died live on television. What most didn't know, NASA had been aware of serious problems since 1977. Yet, they chose to fly anyway. This wasn't a sudden accident or an unpredictable disaster. The real story, the truth they tried to bury, starts long before the tragedy. After the Apollo missions, NASA dreamed even bigger. They wanted a space shuttle that could fly repeatedly, cutting costs and making space travel routine. In 1972, NASA officially unveiled the program, calling it a space truck built tough enough to carry astronauts and satellites regularly. The shuttle wasn't just a vehicle, it was the key to a future space station and a world where space travel felt normal, even every day. After years of work, on April 12, 1981, Columbia soared into space for the first time. The moment was historic. Columbia proved a spacecraft could survive the journey, return safely, and be reused. After four test flights, NASA declared the shuttle ready for real missions. By 1982, it was flying often, and public excitement was sky high. Early on, the shuttle program scored many victories. It launched satellites, ran experiments, and broke barriers. Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. Guyan Bluford was the first African-American astronaut. NASA proudly showed the shuttle as a symbol of power and reliability, promising Congress up to 24 flights a year, even though the shuttle hadn't been fully tested for such a pace. Success gave NASA's leaders confidence, maybe too much. Launches began to feel routine, even when technical delays begged for caution. The pressure to maintain schedules grew stronger every day. By 1985, NASA was pushing full throttle. That year, they launched nine shuttle missions, the most ever in one year. But behind the scenes, the pressure was mounting. Every shuttle needed complex maintenance, and engineers worked around the clock. Last-minute problems cropped up every time, but the rush to meet deadlines left little room for thorough fixes. Managers cared more about schedules than safety. NASA also needed to keep the public excited about space. One big idea, the Teacher in Space project. In 1984, President Reagan announced that a regular school teacher would fly on the shuttle. Over 11,000 teachers applied, hoping to be the first. In 1985, NASA picked Krista McAuliffe, a teacher from New Hampshire. She trained with astronauts and planned to teach lessons from space, broadcasting to classrooms nationwide. Krista's story captured America's heart. Everyone loved the idea of a teacher floating in orbit. For NASA, it was perfect, a publicity dream and proof space travel was becoming part of everyday life. But while the public cheered, many engineers inside NASA grew uneasy. Launch schedules tightened, maintenance time shrank, some technical issues remained unresolved, but because previous flights survived, managers acted like nothing was wrong. This dangerous mindset had a name, the normalization of deviance. It meant risky problems seemed normal because they hadn't yet caused disaster. One hidden danger lurked inside the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. These boosters were built from segments sealed by rubber O-rings. The plan was simple. As boosters fired, heat would cause the O-rings to expand, sealing any gaps. But early tests in 1981 and 1982 showed a troubling flaw. Sometimes the O-rings didn't seal properly. Hot gases leaked through, leaving black soot marks where there should have been an airtight seal. In August 1984, inspectors found soot between two O-rings after a flight. The first seal had failed. Only the backup O-ring had saved that mission. It was a clear, urgent warning. The boosters were not as safe as everyone thought. By 1985, the problem worsened. On a cold January launch, O-rings on both boosters showed damage. In fact, nearly every shuttle flight that year had O-ring erosion. On one mission, even the backup O-ring was damaged. Morton Theocal engineers Roger Beaujolais and Alan McDonald pushed hard for fixes. They proposed new designs, better O-rings, and even a third seal for extra safety. The company began building improved boosters, but they wouldn't be ready for a while. Meanwhile, old boosters kept flying. Everyone knew about the flaw, but past success made people believe it was safe enough to continue. Flights had survived O-ring erosion before, so managers grew comfortable, believing the shuttle would always make it through. But some engineers felt differently. Roger Beaujolais even penned a chilling memo warning, if nothing changed, lives would be lost. 
He called it a disaster waiting to happen, yet his urgent warnings were mostly ignored. NASA's leadership had grown numb to small problems, convinced that since no catastrophe had occurred yet, none ever would. Each successful flight only fed their false confidence. They decided the risk was worth it. Meanwhile, communication between engineers and top managers deteriorated. The danger was mounting, but few at the highest levels truly listened. As 1985 drew to a close, NASA prepared for Challenger's next mission, STS-51L. This wasn't just any launch. Seven crew members were set to fly, Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Michael J. Smith, and mission specialists Judith Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Ronald McNair. Joining them were two payload specialists, Gregory Jarvis and Krista McAuliffe, the schoolteacher. Krista's presence made this mission historic, she would be the first civilian teacher in space. Millions of schoolchildren were poised to watch her lessons live from orbit. The excitement was electric, like nothing NASA had experienced before. The mission had big goals. Besides the teacher program, Challenger was tasked with deploying a $100 million communication satellite and observing Halley's Comet. This would be the shuttle program's 25th mission and Challenger's 10th flight. The original launch date was January 22, 1986, but things didn't go smoothly. Delays from the previous shuttle mission pushed the schedule back. Bad weather and technical problems forced multiple postponements. Challenger's crew suited up again and again, only to have launch cancelled at the last minute. By the time it finally got rescheduled for January 28, it was the seventh attempt. The astronauts handled the waiting with professionalism and calm. In interviews, they smiled and expressed trust in NASA's commitment to safety. What they didn't know was how deeply worried some engineers were about the weather ahead. The night before launch, an eerie cold swept over Florida. By midnight, the air around Kennedy Space Center dipped below freezing. Ice coated the launch pad. It was colder than any previous shuttle launch day. The forecast predicted temperatures around 30 degrees Fahrenheit at launch time. At Morton Theocal, engineers immediately grew alarmed. They knew the cold could stiffen the rubber O-rings, robbing them of their flexibility. Without a proper seal, dangerous gas leaks could occur. And if that happened, the entire shuttle could be destroyed. The engineers scrambled to raise alarms. Meetings were called, and managers were warned that launching in such freezing conditions was a grave risk. Roger Beaujolais and Bob Ebeling were among those who pushed back hardest. They had already seen the O-rings struggle at just 53 degrees. Now, it was even colder. The engineers feared the rubber would harden like plastic, too stiff to seal tightly when the rocket engines fired. NASA called a late-night teleconference to discuss the issue. Engineers from Theocal connected with NASA officials in Florida and Alabama. Usually's team presented charts, reports, and urgent warnings. They pushed for a launch delay. They knew it would cause frustration. They knew it would spark anger. But they believed risking lives was far worse than being late. NASA managers weren't pleased. They were exhausted from constant delays. Challenger's launch had already been postponed several times. Pressure was mounting. Some officials, like Lawrence Malloy, grew impatient. He even snapped, asking if Theocal wanted him to wait until April. NASA argued the engineers' evidence was weak. They pointed out that even though O-rings had eroded before, previous shuttles had still made it safely. Theocal management found themselves trapped between their engineers and NASA. In a moment that would haunt them forever, they urged their engineers to consider the big picture. To think like managers, the engineers' warnings softened under pressure. Theocal executives reversed course. They told NASA they were okay with launching. Beaujolais and others were crushed. One engineer went home and told his wife, it's going to blow up. Morning arrived, and the cold had not eased. Ice clung to metal rails. NASA teams inspected it and deemed it a minor threat. They said it might damage the shuttle if it fell, but wasn't enough to cancel the launch. The countdown continued. Around 11.30 a.m., the astronauts climbed into the shuttle. Dressed in light flight suits, they strapped in. No one told them about the fierce debates overnight. They smiled for the cameras, ready to fly. Crowds gathered despite the cold. Families of the crew were present. Krista McAuliffe's students were there too, waiting to see their teacher become the first ordinary citizen in space. Across the country, millions of children sat glued to their TVs, ready to witness history. At 11.38 a.m., Challenger lifted off. Flames and smoke burst from the engines. Slowly, then faster, it soared into the blue sky. Cheers erupted from the crowd. From the ground, it looked flawless. 
but if you watched closely, faint puffs of grey smoke leaked from the right booster almost immediately. The O-ring wasn't sealing properly. No one noticed in time. The shuttle climbed higher. One minute in, it reached max Q, the point of greatest air pressure. Everything appeared normal. Houston radioed, telling the shuttle to throttle up. Commander Dick Scobie responded calmly, Roger, go at throttle up. Those would be the last words anyone heard from Challenger. 73 seconds after liftoff, a bright flash ripped across the sky. Fire and smoke exploded outward. The shuttle broke apart in a terrifying instant. People on the ground gasped in horror. Pieces of the shuttle rained down in every direction. The huge orange fuel tank had exploded, fueling the massive fireball. Inside mission control, an eerie silence took hold. Then the commentator spoke softly, announcing a major malfunction. Screens went blank, no more signals from Challenger. Everything had gone silent. It took weeks of investigation to uncover the truth behind those first 73 seconds. At first, many believed Challenger had exploded like a bomb. But that wasn't exactly right. The shuttle actually broke apart in mid-air. The real disaster began right at liftoff. When the boosters fired, the rubber O-ring on the right side failed to seal properly. The morning was too cold, and the O-ring had stiffened. Hot gases leaked through a small gap. For a while, bits of burned material plugged the hole, keeping Challenger alive. The shuttle climbed higher, but the damage was already done. About a minute into flight, Challenger hit strong upper-level winds. The shuttle shook violently. That shaking dislodged the plug holding back the leak. At 64 seconds, cameras caught a tiny flame flickering on the right booster. That flicker was the beginning of the end. The flame grew hotter and hotter, burning through the massive external fuel tank. Seconds later, the fire pierced the tank, mixing super-cold hydrogen and oxygen in a violent explosion. At 73 seconds, the right booster broke free and slammed into the tank. The entire structure tore apart. Challenger wasn't built to survive this. Traveling nearly twice the speed of sound, the shuttle shattered. The nose, tail, and wings broke away in the thin, freezing air. What looked like an explosion on TV wasn't the shuttle blowing up whole. It was the fuel igniting and the broken pieces scattering. The two rocket boosters kept flying, spinning wildly until ground controllers destroyed them to keep people safe. In mission control, a voice crackled over the radio. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Panic filled the room. Controllers were frozen in shock. There was nothing they could do. Emergency protocols kicked in immediately. Doors were locked, data servers sealed, and rescue teams sent to scour the ocean, 20 miles off Florida's coast. The hardest question was about the crew. The cabin where the astronauts sat had broken away and stayed intact. It hadn't burned up. It climbed higher, about 65,000 feet, before plunging back toward Earth. Built tough, the cabin stayed mostly together. Inside, the astronauts were violently tossed around. Evidence later revealed at least some were alive after the breakup. Three emergency air packs had been manually activated. Commander Scobies was off, but pilot Mike Smiths and two others were on. Investigators also found cockpit switches moved from their launch positions. Mike Smith might have been trying to regain control. It must have been terrifying. The cabin had no power. It was falling fast and losing air pressure, which would have made the crew lose consciousness before hitting the ocean. When it struck the water, it hit at over 200 miles per hour. The impact was brutal and unsurvivable. NASA later admitted they couldn't say exactly when the crew died. The forces during breakup were survivable. It was the final crash that killed them. At that point, escape was impossible. This harsh truth was one NASA rarely spoke of publicly. Back on Earth, shock rippled across the nation. This was meant to be a proud day, the first teacher going to space. Instead, millions, including schoolchildren, watched a live tragedy unfold. Families gathered to celebrate, now wept openly. At Kennedy Space Center, pieces of Challenger sank into the sea. Mission control was thick with silence, anger, and grief. Every TV network cut into programming to replay the horror again and again. It was the first fatal accident of an American spacecraft during flight. And it happened live, in front of the world. That afternoon, NASA grounded the shuttle program. Everything stopped. President Ronald Reagan had planned a big speech to Congress that night, but he cancelled it. Instead, he spoke directly to the nation from the Oval Office. He comforted the children who had watched the tragedy unfold and honored the bravery of the crew.
He closed with a quote from a poem about touching the face of God. His words brought a flicker of hope to a shocked country struggling to understand what had happened. Three days later, a memorial was held at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Reagan and the First Lady stood among NASA workers, families, and friends. The weather was cold and gray. Military jets flew overhead in a missing man formation, a solemn salute to the lost astronauts. Reagan spoke again, reminding everyone that reaching for the stars sometimes means falling short, but America must never stop trying. His words captured both the pain and the courage swelling in the nation's heart. After Challenger, the country was in shock and desperate for answers. Just days later, President Reagan announced a special commission to investigate the disaster. It was led by William P. Rogers, a former Secretary of State. But he was far from alone. The team included some of the biggest names in space and science, astronaut Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, General Chuck Yeager, astronaut Sally Ride, and the brilliant physicist Richard Feynman. The message was clear, this would not be a shallow, half-hearted review. They were determined to find the truth. At first, NASA tried to launch its own investigation, but the public didn't trust NASA to investigate itself. The Rogers Commission took full control, demanding answers from everyone involved. Over the following months, they interviewed more than 160 people. They split into teams, each digging into a piece of the puzzle, technical failures, NASA's decision-making, the shuttle booster's history, and the intense pressure NASA faced to keep its schedule. The nation watched much of the investigation unfold on TV. One unforgettable moment came from Richard Feynman during a hearing. He took a small rubber ring, the same kind used in the shuttle's joints, and dropped it into a glass of ice water. After it cooled, he clamped it tight, showing how stiff and brittle it had become. Such a simple demonstration, but it revealed the key reason Challenger exploded, the O-ring lost its flexibility in the cold and failed to seal. Richard Feynman's blunt style ensured the investigation was honest and unfiltered. He famously demonstrated how the O-rings became brittle in the cold, proving why they failed. The commission found the explosion was caused by hot gases leaking past the weakened O-rings, nothing else. But the investigation revealed a deeper problem. NASA had known about O-ring issues since 1977, yet neither NASA nor booster maker Morton Theokol fixed them. Risks were accepted without fully understanding the danger. Theokol engineers warned against launching in the cold the night before Challenger's flight, but their concerns never reached top NASA leaders. Middle managers, under schedule pressure, approved the launch. The Rogers Commission exposed major communication failures and found no solid evidence the White House pressured the launch. Pressure came from within NASA itself, desperate to meet deadlines. The final report didn't just blame the O-rings, it condemned NASA's entire system and culture. It demanded redesigning the shuttle's joints, better management of safety concerns, and astronaut involvement in decisions. Had NASA listened to engineers, Challenger's launch would have been delayed until safer conditions. The shuttle would have flown successfully, Krista McAuliffe would have returned to her students, and the teacher in space program continued. Instead, NASA's focus on schedule over safety led to tragedy. The disaster was not due to ignorance of the risks, but because those who knew were ignored. Some suggest politics and business interests played a role, especially since Theokol's contract involved political ties, but no corruption was proven. Still, the system discouraged speaking up, costing lives. If Challenger had survived, the hidden O-ring problem could have caused even worse accidents later. Challenger's tragedy forced NASA and the nation to confront these dangers before more lives were lost.